Amen. Okay, good evening, everybody. So we are on with 2 Samuel chapter 7. Okay, you can prepare your Bible by turning there to chapter 7. And we will read from verse 18 soon. But let me um, just bring up to speed just very briefly because we had a break, right? Uh, what we were doing just before this. Huh? Now, the last week we we were looking at King David who proposed to build God a house. And the, the word of house, uh, actually he meant a temple. He wanted to change the tabernacle, which was a tent, into a permanent structure, a permanent temple. So the Hebrew word uses a word that means house. And when he, when he proposed to build God a house, we find that he received God's word through prophet Nathan, right? That said God would build David's house. So you see, they used the, the play on the words house. And in David's case of house, it means his lineage. That means his descendants, his ancestry further down. Okay? So God promised to establish David's house or his descendants and his kingdom forever. And that is the verse directly in 2 Samuel 7, verse 16. So we see that the Old Testament hymns refer to this Nathan oracle uh, as a covenant. See, when God was giving Nathan a message to pass to David, the word covenant was not mentioned. Okay? But in later references... We shall see. Can somebody help us to turn to 2 Samuel 23, verse 5? All right, we see the word covenant is used. And somebody else can help us to turn to Psalm 89, verse 3 to 4, and verse 28, and then 34. And a third person could help us save time by turning to Psalm 132, verse 12. So first person, second Samuel 23, verse 5. Okay, read uh, second Samuel 23, verse 5. If my house were not right with God, surely he would not have made with me an everlasting covenant arranged and secured in every part. Surely he would not bring to fruition my salvation and grant me my every desire. Surely he will bring to fruition. Okay, so down here you can see David's last words that God made him an everlasting covenant. Uh, somebody from Psalm 89. I read uh, Psalm 89 verse 3. The Lord said, I have made a covenant with David, my chosen servant. I have sworn this oath to him. I will establish your descendants as kings forever. They will sit on your throne from now until eternity. Okay, and then verse 28 and verse 34. 28. I will love him and be kind to him forever. And verse 34. Or, no, I will not break my covenant. I will not take back a single word I said. Thank you. Okay, so you see in all, uh, God says, I will establish your line. I've made a covenant in verse 3. Yes, covenant with my chosen one, referring to David, and establish your line, which is your house, your lineage. Okay, and then in verse 28, you see that uh, God says he will maintain his love and his covenant with David will never fail. And that was uh, then verse 34, I will not violate my covenant. So God promises to keep his covenant with David, which is made here in this chapter. Okay, Psalm 132. Eric, if your sons keep my covenant and the statutes 
statutes, I will teach them. Then their sons will sit on your throne forever and ever. Thank you. Right, so you see that uh, the lineage covenant was unconditional for David. But you see how God says there, if your sons keep my covenant and the statutes I teach, then their sons shall sit on your throne forever and ever. So it's conditional for the succeeding descendants because it depended on their personal response to God. The idea is that they have to maintain the holiness, the holiness that will protect that covenant and ensure that the lineage will continue to inherit the blessing of God. Okay, so the each descendant passing down, they have to maintain the purity of having God work in them then the lineage covenant will continue to uh, run in that son's family. Otherwise, it could go to another son's family. You see, because the, the kings that go on with each generation, they have more than one son. So if the son that is crown prince is not faithful, then the covenant will pass to a crown prince who would be faithful. So that, that is the idea that God actually wanted. Of course, the workout is we saw a lot of kings were not faithful, uh, but God still maintained his covenant to David. So those sons were not blessed. So this covenant of Adonai is special because it does not depend on the condition for David to fulfill certain obligations, right? Other than his, his already faithfulness to God. And in this manner, we see that this Davidic covenant can be compared with the Abrahamic covenant. In Genesis 1 with Abraham and now with David. And in a way, we can say, sorry, unstable connection. Huh? In a way, we can say it is a continuation of God's covenant. God made a covenant to Abraham. So now the covenant continues through David. Two, two, important, um, two important people in the history of the Jews. And we see both Abraham and David were faithful to obey God's will and instructions. So God, in response, promised to make their name great. We can see that in uh, Genesis 12 verse 2 when he was talking to Abraham. And then now in 2 Samuel 7 verse 9, promised to make David's name great as well. And in his grace, he gave them the unconditional covenant that they did not deserve <clears throat> to be a blessing to the nations. And God actually had in mind that his Messiah would descend from their bloodline. Okay? So you see that is the men level, but there's the God spiritual level at the same time. God works at multiple levels. So this points to God's foreknowledge and preparation of the Messiah from the very beginning, right? That there will be this Messiah who deliver his people and the people will look forward to his coming. And he would be a shoot from the stump of Jesse Right, Isaiah 11 verse 1. <clears throat> and this is a case of going all the way back to Bethlehem. Now, why say a stump of Jesse is because the, the, the tree trunk, when it cut down, a lot of people, a lot of descendants, they did not, a lot of kings, they did not maintain the covenant to be faithful to God. Okay, so they were cut off. And God in his omniscience and wisdom was laying the groundwork for the Messiah. That his people would in future anticipate. And we know that when Messiah is revealed, the knowledge and glory of God will fill the earth. Okay, we can see that in references Isaiah 11 verse 9 and Habakkuk 2 verse 14. Right? The knowledge and glory of God will fill the earth with the revelation of Messiah. 
eat three people to quickly turn to one to look at Isaiah 11 verse 9. Another one, Habakkuk 2.14, and then John 12.32. Okay, I can read Isaiah 11 verse 9. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, but the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Okay, Habakkuk 2, okay, 14. I think was a glitch. Okay, I'll read Habakkuk 2, 14. Go ahead. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And John 12, 32. Okay, I will read John twelve thirty two. Uh, but I when uh, but I when I am lifted up, up from the earth will draw all men to myself. Thank you, everybody. So we see that Jesus says that uh, in verse thirty two, when he's lifted up from the earth, that he's talking about his crucifixion. All right, he's talking about his crucifixion leading to his glorification, resurrection, eh? and his resurrection, he will draw all men to himself. And this is where Messiah is revealed as the saviour of all men. And that's where we have the knowledge of glory of God will spread through the earth. So you see, God has actually got a plan for Messiah all the way from the very beginning of history, the problem of human sin and human failure did not spoil God's original plan or intention for mankind, all right? Because God already factored in the coming of Messiah. Yeah, so God is a God who has the foreknowledge, the wisdom and the power to put everything in place even before we were all born. So in effect, God's covenant worked at a dual level. Physically, you know, through the direct descendants of Abraham and David, and then spiritually through faith in Jesus, the Messiah. Yeah. And when God was making these two men great, God purposed that Abraham would be the father of all who believe in Christ, the Messiah that you can see in Romans 4.16 on your own. And so the, Abraham is the model for all believers to put their faith in the salvation plan of God through Jesus. Okay, lift up by Abraham's precedent, meaning Abraham is the example or the model. Um, you remember Jesus said to follow him, you have to leave your father, mother, right? You have to leave your household. And that is exactly what Abraham did. He left his homeland. He left his everything that he was familiar to travel on a journey of faith with God to the promised land. So it's just like Christians. We leave our past. We leave our families that are non-Christian behind. Of course, we want to uh, bring the message of salvation to them. But basically, we are on a journey abandoning our past, abandoning, abandoning all the things that hold us back. Okay, as Jesus said, those who follow him will have to leave father, mother, and so on. Okay, so Abraham started that model of leaving behind, moving forward with God on a journey. For all Christians, the same thing applies spiritually. Now, what about David? David would be great in the ways that he was a man after God's own heart. And we can see that in 1 Samuel 13, 14, and then Acts 13, 22. You can read on your own time. And David was Israel's greatest king, who will do everything God wanted him to do. All right, and that's Acts chapter 13, verse 22, that I was talking about here. And just like the Messiah that he foreshadowed, because Messiah will also be king. 
And as king, David always obeyed God, winning battles, making Israel great, just as his son, the Messiah, will rule over an eternal kingdom to bring all God's people the security and peace they need. So Abraham is a model of all who believe. What about David? David, in the ways that make him great, is the model of a man after God's own heart for us. So you combine the two, that makes a complete, that makes a complete, uh, can I say, the complete picture of what we are meant to be as Christians, God's people. We are meant to be people of faith, just like Abraham, putting his faith in God, and we are meant to be a people after God's own heart, because eventually we are also meant to be servant kings. David was a servant king, right? He was God's servant, and he was Israel's greatest king. So you see the wisdom of God in, in marking Abraham and David, right? Uh, the way he brought greatness to them. And Abraham and David show how we are to put our faith in God and obey his commands so that the purpose he can accomplish the greatest good through us. Their God-given greatness was not their own, not for their own benefit and glory. For David, it was the benefit, the, is the nation of Israel that he ruled. And 2 Samuel 7.10 shows that God's plans and promises for Israel come through David. And these promises came true during his own reign and remained God's ultimate plans for his people, even though they went through political hardships and they suffered in later times, mainly because they sinned against God. Okay, but these plans will finally and ultimately be fulfilled through the son of David, the Messiah. And so that is the talking about the house. God will build his house. Okay, referring to ultimately the Messiah. So in the same way that they apply to Israel, uh, God's plans and promises apply to the Christian community as well. All right, whatever God planned for Israel is a literal plan for the literal people. But those have a spiritual equivalent for Christians. The sad thing is like Israel and Judah, Christians also suffer hardships because of their sin until God's plans are finally fulfilled through Christ's eternal rule. So if you look carefully and think about it, actually God has a double track. It's a parallel track. One is the physical people and one is the spiritual journey and spiritual people. Okay, so pretty interesting how God is working out his plan uh, at this time with David. Okay, so now we come back to uh, chapter 7, 2 Samuel, chapter 7. Can somebody help us to read verse 18 to 29? Carry. Okay, Verse 18, then King David went in and sat before the Lord and prayed, Who am I, O sovereign Lord, and what is my family, that you have brought me this far? And now, sovereign God, in addition to everything else, you speak of giving your servant a lasting dynasty. Do you deal with everyone this way, O sovereign Lord? What more can I say to you? You know what your servant is really like, Sovereign Lord. Because of your promise and according to your will, you have done all these great things and have made them known to your servants. How great you are, O Sovereign Lord. There is no one like you. We have never even heard of 
God like you? What other nation on earth is like your people Israel? What other nation, O oh God, have you redeemed from slavery to be your own people? You make a great name for yourself when you redeem your people from Egypt. You perform awesome miracles and drove out the nations and gods that stood in their way. You make Israel your very own people forever, and you, O oh Lord, became their God. Verse 25. And now, O oh Lord God, I am your servant. Do as you have promised concerning me and my family. Confirm it as a promise that will last forever. And may your name be honored forever, so that everyone will say, The Lord of heaven's army is God over Israel. And may the house of your servant David continue before you forever. Verse 27. O Lord of heaven armies, God of Israel, I have been bold enough to pray this prayer to you because you have revealed all this to your servants, saying, I will build a house for you, a dynasty of kings. For you are God, O sovereign Lord. Your words are truth, and you have promised these good things to your servants. And now, may it please you to bless the house of your servants so that it may continue forever before you. For you have spoken, and when you grant a blessing to your servant, O Sovereign Lord, it is an eternal blessing. Thank you, right? <clears throat> so when Nathan passed David God's message, David went to the temple or went to the tent to pray, okay? He went to God and he entered the tent there and he sat before God and he prayed this prayer, right? And so we see that he responded with thanksgiving to God's promises. That's something for us to learn, you know, to learn God's promises and respond with thanksgiving. And he sat before the Lord. Now sitting was one ancient attitude for worship. David sat most probably on his heels. So imagine uh, sitting on your heels. And this was the posture of the ancient Egyptians before their shrines, before their idols, and the posture of deepest respect before a superior in the East. And people of highest dignity sit in this way when they do sit in the presence of kings. When kings ask them to sit, then they will sit like that. Okay. Now, let's look at uh, the prayer of David. Eh? And you see that he acknowledged God's sovereignty and uniqueness. Yeah, God is sovereign and God is unique. Verse 19 to 21, you see that God is unique and sovereign in dealing with men. So David was in all that. Such a sovereign God would honour a humble, we, we said the last time that God is so big that he's, he can be sitting his throne in heaven and his, and his foot is on earth. Earth is his footstool. So you can imagine, if we think of size, huh, wherever heaven is, that God that sits there and his foot stretches all the way down to earth as his footstool. Our planet is just a place to put God's foot on only. Okay? And such a God would honour a humble person like David. Now, remember, he was merely an insignificant and nameless shepherd looking after his fam family's sheep. Same for us. Think about it. God honours us by giving us salvation, by giving us his love, by giving us everything we need through the death of Christ. See how we are insignificant and nameless, and yet God would honour a humble person like each one of us. Okay? And nothing that David had done or planned to do deserved Adonai's kindness. Nothing we do or we plan to do deserve God's kindness either. 
it all lay in God's own love, will, and purpose. You see, everything is because of God's love. God has a will and a purpose for all these things. So for us, through the Bible, we can only catch a little glimpse of his unimaginable plan. Right? Let's see how Deuteronomy 7, verse 7, uh, verse 7 to 11 tell us. <clears throat> Can somebody read for us? Deuteronomy 7, verse 7 to 11. Okay, I read. Deuteronomy 7, verses 7 to 11. The Lord did not set his affection on you, and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. But those who hate him, he will repay to their face by destruction. He will not be slow to repay the, to their face those who hate him. Verse 11. Therefore, take care to follow the commands, decrees, and laws I give you. Thank you. Okay, so you see there that uh, there is God's unconditional love already in the Old Testament, right? Uh, God chose them not because they deserved it, but because he loved us and kept his oath to the forefathers, right? And then he redeemed. So he saved us, just like Jesus saved us, redeemed us. And he is faithful and he keeps his covenant of love to all who do that. But those who hate him, in a sense, those who don't want to live the life of being a holy person in that sense of uh, wanting good for other people. That's what it means when you say that people hate God. They are not willing to uh, follow God's plans and God's instructions to be a people of love. Right. So these people will therefore uh, face destruction because they would rather sin than follow God's loving plan for them. All right, so we see that nothing David had done or planned deserved his kindness, and it is the same for us. But we do see that God exalts the humble with the right heart towards God and his people. Right, and you see here that God exalted David. Yeah, we see that God exalted David because he marvels, what is my family that you have brought me this far? Right? And if this were not enough in your sight, you have spoken about the future of the house of your servant. So that is the ancestry, right? And uh, in Max modern version, it says the family. Actually, the family in the Hebrew actually means uh, descendants. Okay, so it's not just one generation. And David marvels, is this your usual way of dealing with men, O oh God? So he is just amazed by God, right? This sovereign God. And he acknowledges that he is God's servant, just as all of us are, because we have a work to do. We have service to do for God. Even as he provides all this kindness, love, will and purpose, we are his servants. We also have things to do for him. Right, so for the sake of his word and according to his will, he has done this great thing and then revealed it. So God makes known things that otherwise people would never know. Okay, so he says how great you are, God, sovereign God, there's no one like you, no God like you, no God but you. 
Okay, so it moves on there from verse 22 to God's sovereignty and uniqueness in being the one and only unique God. There's no other God like him and no other nation except Israel experienced his delivering power at the Exodus and the settlement in the Promised Land. And they were a uniquely favoured people. Now, having said that, now, later on, you find in the 8th century, the prophet Amos would declare that Adonai was concerned with the welfare of other peoples as well. Even the Philistines and Syrians had known their exoduses. Okay, uh, can somebody turn to Amos 9.7? And it shows that God was actually concerned with the welfare of other people too. Amos 9, verse 7. Okay, you, must... you go ahead, Georgie. <gasps> oh, okay. Amos 9 7. Right? Are, you, are not you Israelites the same to me as the Cushites, declares the Lord? Did I not bring Israel up from Egypt, the Philistines from Kephtor, and the Arameans from Ker? Thank you. Okay, so that shows uh, that Adonai was actually concerned with the welfare of other peoples as well. All right. Um, and God cares for all people and desires their salvation. All right, so God has chosen a unique nation, a favoured people in Israel, but it does not mean that he doesn't care about other people in the world. All right, and that's where in the New Testament we see John 3.16 God so loved the world. We all are so familiar with that verse. And that is direct from the mouth of Jesus. God as a man himself, yeah? God so loved the world. All right, so God is unique and sovereign, verse 23 and 24, in redeeming a people for himself with wonders and making a name for himself. And you see that David's prayer totally now did not refer to the house he had proposed to build for Adonai. It's too small and irrelevant at this point in time. Okay, because it, com it paled in comparison to Adonai's great kindness to redeem a people to be holy and godly and establish an unending dynasty for his servant. So this is where you see that this part of David's life is actually very, very important for us because it is a point where God made a covenant that would apply to Messiah, talking about Messiah. And so in verse 25, David entreats God, prays to God to please keep your promise, do as you promised. Okay, so he prayed that God would indeed establish his servants' dynasty and through them enhance his, God's own reputation for the knowledge and benefit of all men. It's because God Almighty himself, and you notice in the version Magdalene read the Lord of the host of heaven. So God is the army. Okay, God is the Lord of the armies of heaven. And so that means the most powerful military force, if you want to put it, in all of the universe. God himself had made this covenant that David dared, right? Now he found the courage. David found the courage, he dared, to pray such a bold request and claim what God revealed. Okay, see? Your servant, so your servant has found courage to offer you this prayer because of what you have revealed. So because God himself said it, David therefore 
dared or found the courage to claim that promise that God revealed. And David knew that God is trustworthy with his promise. So this moment is a very significant moment uh, for, the, for the Jews because this moment would bear a keen sense of sadness or regret. Poignancy for the Jews in the time of the exile. Those of you who have read the Bible, you'll know that there's a period that the people went into exile because of their sin and disobedience. Okay? So it was a, a, a sad time for them because they were kicked out of the promised land. And that was when Adonai's will or capacity to his promises seemed in doubt. You know, when people are all kicked out of the promised land, there is the doubt that, oh, God made a promise. How come we are in this sad condition? We are in this sad state, right? So it seems to be something of doubt. And thus, you see that Psalm 89, which begins with the celebration of the covenant of David, which we read just now. Right. Switches dramatically to appealing to Adonai about re now renouncing the covenant. When I do this, miss unstable connection. Huh? So Abraham's promises can seem, uh, sorry, God's promises can seem distant. God's promises can seem very far and like not relevant to us, unreal, forgotten, or even impossible when we go through tough times and hardships. God's promises seem like don't apply to us. It seems to be like, eh, God doesn't care about me. But the truth is, the tough times and hardships have their purpose. Okay? Tough times and hardships have their purpose if, if we view God in the overall picture of what God is doing and seeks to accomplish. Right? The tough times and hardships have their purpose in the overall picture of what God is doing and seeks to accomplish in us and in the bigger scheme of things. Okay, we're all just, we and our suffering and hardships are just one small part of the whole picture. Just one small jigsaw piece only. So while we may be suffering and struggling like crazy, actually it fits into a picture that will be a beautiful picture. And these tough times and hardships may also be God's discipline, lessons, testing of faith, formation of people, community, character, etc. Okay, so God is, I, I like to use this example, God is a little bit like the Chinese people, you know. For the Chinese people, everything also can use. You know, if you if you talk about the chicken, uh, for example, the chicken, uh, okay, the, the meat you can eat, obviously, right? The feathers, you make into feather duster, right? The bones, you make into chicken stock. The chicken shit, you make into fertilizer. So everything good, bad, useless about the chicken, you can find a use for it. So the same thing with God. Everything good and bad, God can find a purpose for it. Isn't that beautiful? Right, okay. So God is the God that nothing is wasted. Yeah, God is a God for whom nothing is wasted if we will only look through his perspective. Okay, even tough times. And David recognized the grace and character of God. He saw in God the great, great redeemer and the establisher of his faith and himself. David did miss him, was due to his own merit. He didn't think that he deserved it. He knew the truth. He concluded his prayer with confidence that 
God would keep his promise, bless his lineage forever. Right. It's a beautiful promise and it's a beautiful prayer that God uh, received from David in response. And we see that God specially chose a nation of people, Israel, so that they would make his name great for men, that means the world, to know him through his dealings with and establishment of this house of his servant forever. And in this way, the chosen nation will be a light of salvation to other nations of the world through David's greater son, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now, we say that about David, Old Testament, but New Testament, it has its own equivalent. The Christian church is God's spiritual equivalent to the Abrahamic descendants to be the light of the world. And it's very important, it is very important for us to see clearly, to understand, embrace, and faithfully carry out God's purpose in this servant role to all men. Okay, so let's move on to chapter eight now. Uh, a little bit of fulfillment of God's promise to David. Can somebody read for us 2 Samuel chapter 8? Uh, it's a very short chapter of just... Okay, minutes. I will read. 2 Samuel you. chapter 8. In the course of time, David defeated the Philistine Pil and subdued, subdued them. And he took Medak Amma from the control of the Philistine. David also defended the Malbitis. He made them lie down on the ground and measured them off with a length of cord. Every two length of them were put to death, and the third length was allowed to live. So the Malbitis be became subject to the David and brought tribute. Moreover, David fought Hada, the son of uh, Rehob, king of Saba, when he went to restore his control along the Euphrates River. David uh, captured a thousand of his uh, carrots, seven thousand carister, and uh, twenty thousand foot soldiers. He hamstrung all but hundred of the carrot horses. When the <laughs> cannot see, I remain of the Damascus came to help. Hada, desert king of Saba. David struck down 22,000 of them. He put a garrison in the Aramean's kingdom of uh, Damascus, and the Arameans became subject to the uh, two and brought tribute. The Lord gave uh, David victory uh, wherever he went. David took the gold shell that belonged to the officers of Hada's desert and brought them to the Jerusalem from Te from Teba from Teba brought them to Jerusalem from Teba and Berotis town that belonged to the Hadak Hadak desert King David took a great quantity of bronze when talking of a uh, Hamad's heart that David had defended the entire army of Hadadezer, he sent his son uh, Joram to King David to greet him and uh, congratulate him on his victory in battle over Hadadezer, who had been at war with Thor. Joram brought. brought with him article of uh, silver and gold and bronze. King David de de dedicated this article to the Lord as he had done with, he, with the silver and gold from all nations. He had subdued, yeah. 
Adam and Mark. The Amor Ammonites and the Philistine and Amal Amalek, he also dedicated the plunder taken from Hade, uh, Hadadezer, son of uh, Rehob, king of Saba. And David became famous after he returned from striking down 18,000 uh, Edo, Edomites in the Valley of Saul. He put garrison throughout Edom and all the Ed Edomites become subject to David. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. David reigns over all Israel, doing what was just and right for all his people. Job, son of uh, Zerah, was over the army. Uh, Jehoshaphat, son of uh, Ahilud, was a recorder. Sadok, son of uh, Ahitop and uh, Amel, Amelex, son of uh, Abita, were priests. Seria was a secretary. Benias, son of uh, Jehiada, was over the Keretit and uh, Palestine. And David's sons were royal advisor. Thank you. Sorry, oh, I was cannot no. see very clearly. <laughs> no, that is all a lot of tongue twisting names. <laughs> Thank you for that reading. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, so in chapter eight, what do we see? We see David's victories, right? Uh, and you and uh, Chai Den has just read all the victory over all these peoples. Okay, and we see that David's victories affirmed that the Lord God Almighty continued to be with him. As we saw in the beginning in chapter 5, verse 10, that God was with David. Okay, and remember that God was called the Lord of hosts, right? Uh, he's not called Lord of hosts for nothing. Lord of hosts referring to the armies of heaven. So you can see the armies of heaven were fighting with David. All right, and God was working out his promises to David to make him famous, make his name great. Did you notice just now the, uh, the reading in verse 13 that David became famous? So God was making his name great. Some victories recorded in this chapter took place before chapter 7, uh, uh, mentioned in chapter 5 actually. And this account in 2 Samuel 8 and also chapter 10 continues from chapter 5. And it goes on to list his other victories. Now, if you are interested, you can go and read First Chronicles 20 because it will give you more details about the capture of Rabbah, of the Ammonites, and then three other battles with the Philistines. Right, but let's look at this chapter. So in verse 2, we see that David also defeated the Moabites. And then for every one third of them, right, he allowed to live, but every two thirds of them he put to death. And so they became his subject and they had to bring him tribute. So what can we see in this? We see that David was actually the great grandson of Ruth who was from Moabite. Uh, Moab, sorry, what Moabite? She was a Moabitess, right? And she was the great grandmother of David. Now, this warfare against the Ammonites is unexpected because if you remember in earlier days when he was running away from Saul in his fugitive days, he had happier relations with Moab. First Samuel 22, verse 3 and 4. Remember, he brought his aged parents to King Moab and put them with the king to look after them to uh, make sure that they were safe from King Saul, when he was a fugitive. So those were happy days, all right? Those were happy days. And we see that alliances made with people who are not equally yoked may not conclude in lasting harmony, right? Say that again, alliances made with people who are not equally yoked may not conclude 
include in lasting harmony. They don't last long. Because when we behave like the people of the world in the dog dog world, our alliances are based on mutual benefit. So the moment you are no use to somebody, then they kick you out or they fight you. And it's only God, only God who gives graces, grace and benefits to those who are enemies and do not deserve his loving kindness. Right? And we can see that in Matthew 5, 46 to 48. So those who are not on the same, in that sense, I use the word platform of being godly together, all right, uh, they, they may not continue on in a lasting covenant of relationship. Okay, so not on the same platform. And if Christians are not on the same platform, then uh, it really shows that Christians are not really doing the right thing. So it is when we as God's people show that our alliances are based on God's divine love, you know, where we benefit others, not because you scratch my back, I scratch yours. That kind of benefit. Then the world will see how holy or different God is and how those who truly worship him are holy like this, like their God. Do we even contemplate working on this mindset and characteristic of God in our relations and connections with people? Divine grace and generosity rather than self-interest. And you see that uh, we are not here to only benefit each other when we benefit, okay? But we are here to learn God's divine love. And God gives because God gives because of his grace and he gives to those who do not deserve his loving kindness. Whether we, we try to do the same thing. Now in verse three, we see that now uh, David fought Hadadezer, right? And he captured a thousand of his chariots and 7,000 charioteers and 20,000 foot soldiers and hamstrung everything except a hundred of the chariot horses. Now, the use of horses and chariots huh, is actually a military advantage for the enemies. Okay, because in terms of technology at that time, horses and chariots would be more superior. Now, hamstringing the chariot horses of Hadadezer cut the military power of the enemy because now they would have to depend on their infantry, all right? So David equalized the, equalized the uh, military power, bring their scale down to his infantry level. And in terms of the law of God, nah, the law of Moses, the law forbid the king to acquire large numbers of horses for himself. And so down here, you, didn't, you don't see that David kept the horses for himself. He hamstrung them. Okay, so he disabled the horses. And you can see that in Deuteronomy 17, verse 16. Can somebody turn there for us? And another person look for us in Psalm 20, verse 6 to 9. Deuteronomy 17, verse 16. And Psalm 20. I read uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 17, verse 16. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. So we are not to go back to e Egypt and fight the way of our old life. Yeah, not fight the way of our old selves and old world. Not go back to our old, old way of life to find power and strength in spiritual warfare as a Christian. Psalm 20. Psalm 20 verse 6 to 9, it says, Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He answers him from his holy heaven 
with the saving power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fail, but we will raise up and stand firm. O Lord, save the king. Answer us when we call. Thank you. All right. So you can see that put these two references together. The people of God are meant to depend on him, not on chariots and horses. That's a, that's a famous verse. Eh? Some trust in chariots and some trust in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Right? Quite a famous verse. I think somebody has made that into a song sometime. And so you see that the whole idea of God not allowing the Israelites to have horses is to depend on him. And this is what David is doing when he hamstrung the horses of the enemy. It cuts the enemy's power because God gave him the ability to defeat them in spite of their superior technology. Okay, so we rise up and stand firm that was uh, Psalm 20, verse 8, whereas they are brought to their knees and fall. So this is what we see about David depending on God, really, really showing the trust that God will fight for him on his side. And then we will find in later history that David's rebel sons, Absalom and Adonia, were the first in Israel to make use of horses and chariots. In chapter 15, verse 1, and 1 Kings 1, verse 5. Okay, so you see in later days when, when people of God start blurring the lines, this of disobedience, they will start introducing doing things that are violating God's laws. Yeah, slowly, slowly, the, the gate is open to sin, disobedience through what looks like harmless. You know, what looks like harmless actions, but are actually disobedience and lack of trust in God. Okay, what seems harmless is actually a sign of lack of trust in God. We may not, we may not think twice about it, yeah, but in God's law or in God's eyes, it shows a lack of trust in Him. And then later on, Solomon would trade in horses, and also built chariot cities that formed the backbone of his country's defense in 1 Kings chapter 10. But now David continued to show dependence on God instead of being influenced by the peoples around him to engage in battle in their way through amassing chariots. So in that sense, God, does, God forbids us to go back to Egypt to get horses for the Christian spiritual journey God forbids us as Christians to go back to our old ways to fight spiritual battles, okay? God forbids us to go back to our old style, our old world, to find all those uh, ways to empower ourselves, enhance our ability to fight spiritual battles because God himself is the one we need to trust. So verse 5, when the Arameans of Damascus came to help Hadadezer against David, you see that David struck down 22,000 of them. Okay, you can see alliance of the enemies, but still David was victorious. And he put garrisons there, right, in the Aramean kingdom of Damascus, that is Syria, Syria, and they became subject to him and brought tribute again. And once again, we see the Lord gave victory, David victory wherever he went. You always see God at work. And even when the enemies allied against God, he, uh, against David, he reduced them to vassal states. Huh? And God would enable his people to have victory, even when they appear to be weaker in a war when his people fight for his cause, okay? Even when God's people appear to be weaker, but his people fight for his cause, God would give them victory. 
Now, David fought God's battles in obedience to establish Israel in the land surrounded by pagan nations. Okay, so this is, this is uh, an important realization. David was obedient to God in fighting the battles where he had all the pagan nations, pagan nations surrounding him. And the Bible says two times that the victories come from Adonai, earlier on in verse 6 and later on, that is here, verse 6, and later on in verse 14. So it's like a bracket. So what did David do in verse 7? Took the shields and brought to Jerusalem and took bronze. Okay, bronze can be used for making a lot of useful things. So the superior king in war would take away useful metals and military shields as their prize, which later on also in Solomon's time or later than Solomon's time, in the days of Solomon's son Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, would also capture the gold shields at that time. First Kings verse chapter 14. Eh? So here when two king of Hamath heard that David had defeated the army of Hadadezer, he sent his son to greet David and congratulate David. And then they brought him articles of silver and gold and bronze. And you can see that God is uh, establishing peace over the land when the enemies and even allies acknowledge David's superiority. And generally, people want to befriend God's people when they see the blessing that God gives. But people want to be friends with Christians, even though there are people who are jealous. Yeah. So there are people who admire, but people who also want to associate. Just like when you see in Egypt, Moses was leaving Exodus, huh? Israelites were moving Egypt. You find that a lot of Egyptians followed them out because they were attracted by their God, the God of Israel. And this is what's happening here as well. Okay, people who acknowledge that these Israelites, this David had a special God. And David would dedicate the articles to the Lord. Okay, uh, and all the gold and silver from the nations that he, that he defeated. So he dedicated the spoils of war and the dip diplomatic gifts to God because God is the giver of his success. And you see the list of conquests includes most of Israel's familiar enemies that uh, Saul fought. And the victories over Edom and Ammon are anticipatory, right? We will see the victories in chapter 10 and, uh, oh, sorry, in chapter 10 and 12 for Ammon. And then you have the episode of David and Bathsheba is right in the midst of the war time, okay? So verse 13, you see that David became famous. Uh, this is God keeping his promise. All right, remember, God said he would make his name great. Yes, and so this particular uh, battle, he became famous. And it was uh, accomplished through Abishai, son of Zeruiah. In First Chronicles 18, verse 12. Can we turn to First Chronicles 18, verse 12? Uh, whoever reads can read for us verse 12 and 13. First Chronicles 18, verse 12 and 13. Okay, I read uh, First Chronicle chapter 18, verse 12. Abishai, son of Zeruiah, struck down 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. He put garrisons in Edom, and all the Edomites became subject to David. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. Thank you. Okay, so down here in Second Samuel, it said that David returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. But in 1 Chronicles 18 verse 12, we see that uh, Abishai, 
son of Zeruiah was actually the uh, the commander. Okay, he was actually the commander of that battle, just as his brother Joab was also the overall army commander. But in this case, Abishai was the one who was uh, fighting that battle, but he received the credit as the supreme commander. But David as king, this battle would of course be, be uh, uh, attributed to David. Okay, so this account of how David accomplished the battle through Abishai helps us to understand his victory over the uh, Ammonite Aramean coalition later in 2 Samuel 10. Okay, so you can see it's not just David alone, even though he is given the credit, huh? right? And at the time, Abishai's brother, Joab, struck down 12,000 Edomites. Okay, and that is where you see the, the title of Psalm 60. Title of Psalm 60 was actually about that battle. Huh? When David fought Aram Naharaim and Aram Zobah, and when Joab returned and struck down 12,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. Okay, so you can see the two brothers' involvement in this, in this time of battles. And then David put garrisons throughout Edom so that all the Edomites became subject to him. Verse, eight, verse 14. Yeah, the Edomites, all the Edomites became subject to David. And he, the posting of garrisons meant that trade routes in these subject areas were protected and tribute could be levied on a regular basis. So it was actually good for trade to put those garrisons there to protect people. And in all his successes, you see that Lot gave David victory wherever he went. Repeated again, eh? the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. Just now was verse 6. Here, verse 6. And then now here again, verse 14. The Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. That is a bracketing. Bracketing of the battles that were successful because of God. And so we see in verse 15, David reigned over all Israel, doing what was just and right for all his people. And then there's a record of all the people in his administration. What we see is David presented as the ideal ruler. Okay, David was the ideal ruler over a unified kingdom. And he ruled with the principles of justice and equity. Fairness, just and fair. And these are the characteristics of divine rule. Okay, so David represented God, in other words. Yeah, David was God's earthly representative. He represented God by being this ruler. Okay, and, and that would be a picture. David, God was showing David and the pagan nations his superiority and it's a picture of the rule of King Jesus. The rule of Jesus when he comes. Okay, so can we look at Psalm 99 verse 4? Psalm 99 verse 4. Today a lot of references. Okay, I read Psalm 99, verse 4. Mighty King, lover of justice, you have established fairness. You have acted with justice and righteousness throughout Israel. Thank you. So this is the king referring to God as king. Huh? The sum is the sum is uh, talking about the Lord, the Lord reigns in verse 1. Okay, so um, in Psalm 9 verse 4, you see the, that God rules just the way that David is ruling as mentioned here. 
you can see then that David is really a representative of God. Uh, in that sense, a visible, a visible representative for God. Showing what kind of God David has. So question for us is, David shows, David shows what kind of God he worshipped. What do we show about the God we worship? Okay, it's a, it's a good example to see. Huh? And then from verse 16 and 17 and 18, you see a list of the chief officials. Okay, you see a list, a list of the chief officials uh, of uh, David's infant administration. You see, Joab was the commander of the army, but David is commander in chief. And the, the lesson we should see from this listing of people is that it takes many people to run, it takes many people to run a kingdom. It takes, takes many people to make sure that things go well. Of course, you can have many people and spoil the whole picture as well, right? Uh, but it, it, really sh it really shows what do you want to make of your, in this case, kingdom, yeah? What do you want to make of your Christian organization, your church? What do you make, want to make of your country? Or what do you want to make of your community? Yes. So it takes many people to play their roles. What? So that the kingdom or community of God can carry out the functions well. Okay, so in, in this picture, you see that uh, you need a lot of people. David cannot do everything by himself. Similarly, the people in the body of Christ have to play their part. So each one of us has a part to play. We have responsibility so that the whole community will accomplish what God has called each one of us to do and things will work out properly. We have one more chapter to finish, chapter 9. It's a short chapter of 13 verses. Can, can somebody help us to read? Chapter 9, enter Mephibosheth. Nine to verse what? Uh? At the end of the chapter, 13 verses only. Okay, uh, chapter 9. Huh? Yeah, we try and finish this. Okay. Verse 1. Here, O Israel, you are now about oh, to no, cross no. the Jordan. 2 Samuel, huh? sorry. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. I got Second it wrong. 2 Samuel. Sorry. Very sorry, okay. Uh, chapter 9. 2 okay. Samuel, All right, chapter all right. 9. Sorry, sorry. Mm. Uh, David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's house, whole name Ziba. They called him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? Your servant, he replied. The king asked, Is there no one still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan, and uh, he is crippled in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, He is at the house of Makir, son of Amel in Lo Dibar. So King David had him brought from Lo Dibar from the house of Makir, son of Amel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied, don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I'll restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Verse 8, Mephibosheth bowed down and said, 
What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I've given your master's grandson everything that belongs to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servant are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always sit at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Verse 11, then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth had a David's table like one of the king's son. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table, and he was crippled in both feet. Thank you. All right, so we have a very short chapter of uh, David remembering his friendship and covenant with Jonathan. And that was back in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 3, and chapter 20, when they renewed their covenant in 20, verses 12 to 15. Eh? So verse 1, you see David asking around for uh, anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom he can show kindness for Jonathan's sake. So he remembers his covenant with Jonathan and the covenant did not just extend to Jonathan's side of the family, it also goes to the house of Saul. You can see the umbrella of blessing, yeah? The umbrella of blessing extends to the whole family and not just to Jonathan. And you see that David was now in a position to fulfill his long-standing covenant with Jonathan. And this intended kindness fulfilled a second purpose. First purpose is covenant, promise. Second is a gesture of loyalty and regard for the dead soul and any disgruntled people grumbling about his being replaced by David, a non-Benjamite. That's to say, it's a politically good move, okay? It's a politically good move. So you can see that there's a friendship reason. There's a possible political motive as well. All right. Now, a suspicious mind would argue that David's real motive was politically motivated desire to keep an eye on Mephibosheth. You know, in case Mephibosheth nursed an ambition to rebel, huh? to restore the kingdom, okay? Like uh, what we can see in chapter 16, verse three. Now this kind of thinking goes against the promise of God for those who are suspicious in this way, right? It goes against the promise of God and Jonathan's plea in 1 Samuel 20 and the gratefulness, loyalty and generosity of David's spirit, okay? So, uh, it's a bit unkind to David to think that he's just politically motivated to keep an eye on somebody who can be a threat to him. Suspicious minds tend to mold people into their own image of being small-minded and bitter from what life and they have made of themselves. Right. So if we have suspicious minds about everything, about everybody, um, you know, we may need to think about what makes us like that? Think of what happened to Mikhail, Saul's daughter. You know, she, she had a perception that was way different from David. Yeah, and uh, the poor, poor, result, poor thing for her was that she ended up childless for the rest of her life. Okay, so in contrast, being genuinely kind and gracious can achieve much more than we may anticipate. Right? Whether there are people who are suspicious of our moves and motives, grace and kindness are divine characteristics of God that people would approve. It is right and commendable to display kindness and grace, not to win the approval of people, though it is 
also a good model for others to learn. All right, so we can do good and right and kindness for various reasons. All right, um, and it's also good that it's a model for people to learn. Right, we don't just do good for people to approve. Most importantly, for the person that's being kind and gracious, it needs to flow from the character we already are or we are forming. So we're talking about being Christ-like, okay? Doing a lot of good things, what's important is it comes from the Christ-like character we are becoming or that we have uh, become a little bit more and not just because we want people to praise us. Okay, so when David, um, David picked up Jonathan's reference here to the loyal love of the Lord in 1 Samuel 20 verse 14 when it says, is there no one still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Okay, so God's kindness here is uh, the reference of the loyal love of the Lord. Sometimes what we call the loving kindness you know the song, thy loving kindness is better than life. You know that, the loving kindness? Yes, that's the word, okay? Loving kindness. So David picked up on Jonathan's reference to God's loving kindness. And in keeping with the spirit of God's loving kindness and covenant with Jonathan, David made every effort to find out if there was someone left in the family line of Saul that he could be kind to. He received God's great kindness and he wanted to, to extend it to Saul's descendants, even though Saul did not deserve it. Okay, you can see a picture of God's loving kindness in David. Yeah, his, his king Saul wanted to kill him, but he now still wants to show loving kindness, even though Saul did not deserve it. And this is the loving kindness of God that his people must emulate if they are truly his worshippers in spirit and in truth. Okay, so he asked uh, Ziba where to find um, Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth. And Ziba said, He's at the house of Machir, son of Amiel, in Lodibar. Okay, let's see. Machir was son of Manasseh. Who was Manasseh? Manasseh was son of Joseph. Do you remember Joseph in Genesis? Right, the Joseph with the, uh, the Joseph in Egypt that was kind to his brothers. Okay, that, that Joseph there, son of Jacob, he had a son called Manasseh and Machir was one of the descendants. Okay, and the Machirites were great soldiers. So in a sense, um, for Mephibosheth to be in the house of Machir means he was protected. He was protected by great soldiers. In Joshua 17 verse 1, you can find that. Okay, so um, David learned that he, Mephibosheth was at Lodiba, so he located him and he had Mephibosheth brought to him. Let's take a look at this map. Huh? Okay, uh, It's a tiny little map, or rather the places are so tiny. Here's Lodiba. Lodiba here. Okay, now this is the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Galilee. This side is Israel, and this side would be Bashan. And go down to uh, this side would be Moabites. Okay, Moabites. And then Rabbah here will be the Ammonites. And then Lodiba, this is where the half tribe of Manasseh. Those of you who are familiar, when the Israelites entered into the promised land, half tribe of Manasseh there, here. Manasseh, half tribe, occupied part of the land on this side of the Jordan, and the other half of Manasseh occupied the other side of the Jordan. Okay, so half tribe, Manasseh here, half tribe there, 
and then you have get and one more would be Reuben. Okay, and just now you read Damascus, which is Syria up here. The Arameans that Chai Den was reading, the Arameans were up here. Okay, so Lodiba, Lodiba, Mephibosheth was here under uh, Machir, Machir, living with Machir, and David was in Jerusalem, which would be across the Jordan River. This is the Dead Sea and Jerusalem would be somewhere around here. Uh, here we have Bethlehem, and here's Jerusalem, okay? So you have Jerusalem here. David had people to look for. Jerusalem here, David had people to look for all the way to Lodiba up here. So Mephibosheth had to travel from here all the way across here to Jerusalem to David, all right? You can see it has to cross the Jordan River and go all the way north up there, okay? And this is the Dead Sea or the Salt Sea, eh? all right? The Dead Sea or the Salt Sea, yes. So that's the map. Let's come back to our notes. So in verse six, eh, Mephibosheth came to uh, David. You see, he was son of Jonathan, son of Saul, he came to David and he bowed down to pay him honor. And you see that uh, David had to assure him, don't be afraid. Okay, the first thing, don't be afraid, David had to say to him. Now, Mephibosheth was probably apprehensive because he knew the fate of his uncle Ishbosheth. Remember, his uncle Ishbosheth was killed by two of their own people, right? And further, his nurse, furthermore, his nurse, uh, uh, when he was only five years old, his nurse picked, it, nurse picked him up to run away and he had a fall and then he became lame in both legs, right? And so that would have been a huge trauma on him. Imagine uh, five years old, five years old, your nurse picks you up, runs away and your nurse drops you and you fall down in such a way that you become lame in both legs. That would be very traumatic. So David's need to assure him not to be afraid. Okay, because we see, we know that bad memories and experiences in the days of youth, when people are young, they have bad memories and experiences that are traumatic. These often leave a long shadow of fear in a person's later life. So from five years old, a person can have fear up to adult life. And David gave a statement of his gracious intentions. He told Mephibosheth, don't it be afraid. Here's what I plan to do for you. He was not going to treat Mephibosheth as a rival to compete against. And his specific expressions of covenant loyalty to Jonathan's son included restoring restoring to him all the land that had belonged to Saul and then welcoming him, accepting and welcoming him as a permanent guest at his table. So just the way that God treats us, huh? just the way that God treats us, God restores our relationship with him and God welcomes us to eat with him at the banquet in heaven. So Mephibosheth deserved nothing David was giving him, just like we all don't deserve anything from, from God. But it was because of David's covenant love and friendship with his father that he was given his grandfather's land and the favor to eat at the king's table. And in the same way, we deserve nothing that God gives to us. It is his grace and covenant love that we enjoy the blessings of life. Okay, so David, again, you see, once again, he shows the kind of God he worships. He shows the character of God through the loving kindness concept. So he showed the loving kindness as a 
covenant person in relationship with Jonathan. He also showed the justice and equity as a kingly representative of God. And so in, in, his, in these capacities, that this, these are the things that make him great. Okay, in his, these capacities, these are the things that make him great. So Mephibosheth bowed down and says, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? See, his self-deprecating reference to a dog, he calls himself a dog, uh, actually shows he recognized his position of complete dependence on God's, on David's mercy. Now, he was totally dependent on David to be merciful. Same, we can be, and we are totally dependent on God's mercy to us for everything in life and for godliness. Everything comes from God. So we are as good as dead dogs. We are dead in our sin. Just like Mephibosheth recognizes his uh, helplessness and his dependence. Okay? We are helpless and dependent Mephibosheth on God's loving kindness. Okay, so the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and told him that I've given your master's grandson everything, returned everything to him. So you and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring the crops fight for him and then your Mephibosheth is the grandson of your master he will always eat at my table and you see that Mephibosheth himself had 15 sons and 20 servants what does that mean well from the beginning here we see that Ziba was appointed Mephibosheth's steward no? or estate manager he was in charge of Mephibosheth's property. Uh, before David enlisted his help to find Mephibosheth, he lived on his own, and he was actually aware of Mephibosheth's location. He could find him. But now that his master's grandson had been given back source properties and land, he was recalled back. Right this time to save, serve his master's grandson. And you see the reference to his having 15 sons and 20 servants. Shows us he might be a steward, but he was rich. Right? He might be a steward, but he was rich. He had 15 sons. Okay? And there was a considerable amount of property involved because you need 20 servants. You need 20 servants to look after the property as well as the, as the people. To serve the people. And we can learn that Ziba served as he was required based on David's instructions. Just like we serve because God commands us to do so. Yeah, we serve just as God commands us to do so. Now, what kind of steward he remained was to be seen in latter days of crisis. Okay, I want to just use it a blue. Okay, so now he looks like a good servant. How long does he remain a good servant and does he remain good all the, all the days of his life? Okay. Uh, similarly, the kind of servant of God we are remains to be seen in, in days when trouble and turmoil are stirred up. Okay. The kind of servant of God we are remains to be seen in days when trouble and turmoil are stirred up. Meanwhile, as we are called, we serve, right? Just as Zeba was called and he served. And our true and deeper character and colors are not obvious in the time of order. When everything is fine, everything goes on well. Everything is when Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Yeah. But our true and deeper character and colors here will be tested when the order is upset and overturned. 
So what I'm saying is that for Ziba, he looks like he continues to serve the master's grandson. Does he serve well? Later on, a different chapter, we will see something about his behavior. Okay, so verse 12, we see that Mephibosheth had a young son named Mika. Okay, and Ziba's household were all his servants. He lived in Jerusalem and he always ate at the king's table. And the Bible repeats he was crippled. In so it emphasizes his helplessness. Okay, being crippled in both feet emphasizes his helplessness. Now, a little bit of history he was actually five years old at the time of Gilboa. Remember Gilboa, Mount Gilboa? That was the mountain where his grandfather and his father Jonathan fought their last battle and died. Right, and then he had to flee. Now his son Mika. Now at that time he was five years old, so it would take many years before Mika was born. Right, Mika would have not been born until well into David's reign. Okay, so many years later, then Mika would be born, and David would be king for quite a long time. Some people may see this mention of him as indication of how right it was of David to keep watch on this boy and his father, yeah, to, to keep an eye on Mephibosheth and his son, because Mephibosheth and the son could one day try to compete and claim the throne, right? And events could develop like in later history of the kings, where you know one of the children of the kings grew up in secret, protected by the priest, and then he grew old enough and he caused the downfall of the queen at the liar. You know, the queen who usurped the throne, right? And she, she, was, uh, she was dethroned because there was a child king who grew up in secret. That was in 2 Kings 11. But when you, read, when you read the rest of the story, you'll find that nothing further is known of Micah except his genealogical uh, in inclusion in 1 Chronicles 8.34 and 9.40, okay? So what people think about David and the possibility of Mephibosheth and his son Micah rising up to fight back for the throne did not happen. So a larger view of this reference to Micah shows a more significant meaning to David's action. Covenant between David will bring blessing not only okay, the, the covenant between Jonathan and David between Jonathan and David will bring blessing not only to Mephibosheth but also on subsequent generations of Jonathan's descendants. This is also a picture of God's covenant with his people in the second commandment, right? In Exodus chapter 20, God's commandment is you shall not make for yourself an idol, no worshiping idols in heaven, on earth, or in the waters, because I, your God, am a jealous God punishing, but also showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Okay, so here is a picture again of subsequent generations being blessed, being blessed. Okay, and so you see our covenant relationship as God's people should or needs to imitate the model relationship of David and Jonathan. Right, our covenant relationship as God's people. They are... They, they mean David and Jonathan are a demonstration of the love and faithfulness that God's people should have towards each other as a response of being children deeply loved by the Heavenly Father. First John 3 1 right, talks about the love of God the Father. When we are impacted deeply enough by our Heavenly Father's love, we will be able to express this covenant love in our relationships with fellow men just like David and Jonathan did with each other, and we will be able to bless succeeding generations by it. 
Okay, we have just four minutes or so. Uh, any questions or would you prefer me to play this song? I think I shall play this song. Just give me a moment. Can you see? Can you see the video? How deep Can you hear the sound? Yes. Love for us. How vast beyond our measure that he should give his only son. To make a wretch his treasure How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns his face away As wounds which mar the chosen sons to glory Behold the man upon a cross My sin upon his shoulder A shame Right, so we see that it is because of the Father's love reflected in David and Jonathan that we see such a beautiful story, a covenant love, right? A covenant love between two people of God, right? And that is also true that our relationship with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ should be that covenant relationship that really shows the Father's love. Shall we pray? Maybe just for a few seconds, you pray and perhaps invite God to make a deeper change and commitment in you, right? So that his covenant love can be seen flowing out of you. So just a few moments of silence for you to pray in your heart.
Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your covenant love that provides for us in ways that we do not understand and that moves from generation to generation to a thousand generations of those who love you. We thank you, God, that your great love is something we may not deserve, we may not fathom, but it is still something that we can receive, we can enjoy. And very importantly, we can also imitate and let ourselves be a channel to, for your covenant love and faithfulness to flow out to other people. And so we pray, God, that you make us a people of such faithfulness as yourself, so that we may reflect your your knowledge and your goodness, oh God, to a world that is not like this. We give you thanks and praise, Father, for all things that we simply cannot imagine, but you make available and possible for us. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.